Hi, my name is Jay. I'm going to be talking to you today about um, a system for identifying and localizing objects using a Kinect depth image sensor. Uh, this is joint work with Arjun Singh, uh, uh, Stephen Miller, and uh, Peter Abiel. So the problem we're trying to solve is shown here. We have a color point cloud uh, with four household objects on the table, and we'd like to identify and localize all objects in the scene. We're especially interested in the problem from a household robotics perspective. For a specific robot in a specific home or office environment, the number of relevant objects is not that large. So in this setting, we have the opportunity to gather and pre-process very structured information about each individual object at training time. For robotics applications, though, we also need to operate in near real time. So the challenge is to effectively leverage the abundance of training data available at training time uh, with limited computational resources available at testing time. When we're presented with a test connect scan, our approach first segments each object of interest into its own cluster. Then for each cluster, we run a hypothesis selection step to select the most promising subset of object hypotheses from a large database. For each of these hypotheses, we run a pose recovery step to both re extract the pose and actually decide if they're present in the scene. And this is repeated for each object cluster. The segmentation strategy we use is fairly standard. Uh, we extract supporting planes from the image and then use a glomer clustering to recover different object clusters. We'll take a closer look at the hypothesis selection step. Our hypothesis selection step involves a simple probabilistic model. Given a set of generic features f of r, we'd like to compute the conditional probability that an object belongs to a given class y. We can rewrite this conditional probability distribution using Bayes' rule as a prior over class labels times the conditional probability of observing the features given that class label. If we again assume that the features are generated independently of one another and depend only on the class label y, we can rewrite this as the product of multiple conditional probabilities, one per feature. This is the naive Bayes assumption. We need some way now of obtaining both the prior distribution and the condi conditional distribution for a feature given a label. For the prior term, it's often reasonable to assume that every uh, class label is equally likely a priori. And for the feature uh, model, we're going to learn that from data. Since we might not have any special insight into the functional form of the conditional distribution, P of F given Y, we're going to use kernel density estimation. So as an example, let's pretend the feature F we're interested in is the percentage of red pixels in, in an image. And let's say we have two different classes that we'd like to distinguish, soup bottles and soup and, uh, and juice bottles. So I need to learn the following two distributions. I need to learn P of uh, F given Y equals soup and P of F given Y equals bottle. Let's say I have some training images of both soup and bottle. For the first training image of soup, I compute the percentage of red pixels. Let's say it's like 60% red pixels. Just because I observed F equals 0.6 once, doesn't mean I think that all images in this class have to have f equals 0.6. I might consider it place a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution as my belief about what objects in the class are like. I'll repeat this process for another image. Let's say it's 40% it's red. Um, that mean, then I'll throw down another Gaussian centered around 0.4. And for each training image, I add a kernel function centered at the feature value. In this case, the kernels I'm using are Gaussians, but in general, there are many different options you could use. After I'm done going through all my training data, I average and normalize these distributions together. So this would be my, dis uh, this would be my distribution for P of F given soup. I can repeat this process for uh, images of bottles. So in this case, you know, bottles have less red, so I'm more likely to see fewer red pixels. Let's assume we want to do a naive Bayes classification using the model we just learned. In this example, we have a single feature and two classes, so we've assumed that bottle and soup are equally likely, our model reduces to just the probability P of F given Y. When we observe a new test image to classify it, we find the percentage of red pixels in this image, let's say it's 0.5, and use it to compute the conditional probability P of F given Y for both of these two classes. So in this case, the naive Bayes model would predict with about 80, maybe 80% 80 probability that this object is a soup can and 20% probability that it's a bottle. In the more general case, to compute the model for P of F given Y, uh, for a test feature F, we need to sum over all instances of the class Y in the training data, find the feature value for that training instance, and put a Gaussian kernel at that point. So this is just explaining in equations what we just did graphically. This tends to be expensive as the number of features grows, because you need to do some processing for every uh, feature in your training set. This operation is also performed many times, so it can't be that slow. 
Instead of summing up over all data in our training set, it turns out we can approximate this function using just the nearest neighbor to f in the training data for y. This is the largest term in the summation, and it tends to dominate because of the exponential tails of the Gaussian distribution. This approximation is also very efficient to compute, because instead of needing all the points in your training data, you now only need the distance to the nearest training feature. This was shown in Boyman et al. that this technique performs very well on state-of-the-art computer vision data sets. So here's our complete model. Um, we use two different types of features uh, in our model, hue histograms and SIFT features. So I'm going to take a closer look at both of these. Our hue histogram descriptor is a global per viewpoint descriptor. We take an, uh, an image or a view of an object in RGB, convert the pixels to HSV space, and bin them into 25 equally spaced hue bins. We also have separate black and white grayscale bins for pixels with poor color information. So this gives us a 27 dimensional descriptor. At training time, we can reconstruct the object using views taken from all sides and generate synthetic views at multiple different orientations. For each of these orientations, we're going to compute a hue histogram descriptor. We also extract local image descriptors. So we look for distinctive SIF key points and extract SIF descriptors. At training time, we again extract these descriptors from training images taken from all different views of the object. So, given a test instance, we start with a uniform prior over all object labels. We extract a hue histogram and SIFT features, and we can use our model to compute the posterior probability of each class using the features extracted at test time. This gives us a ranking of all the object hypotheses from high to low probability. For the most likely hypotheses, we now run a pose recovery verification step, which takes advantage of geometry information. How this works is we take the SIF points extracted during the hypothesis selection and choose three randomly chosen points, or randomly choose three points. Here they're shown in red, uh, yellow, and blue. For each of these SIF points, we look up the nearest neighbor SIF match in our training set for this hypothesis and find the corresponding location on the 3D model. Our algorithm will try to compute a pose which aligns these points together. In this case, it's not able to find a good match because the red SIF point uh, the nearest neighbor SIFT match is on a very different part of the object. Um, to actually do this pose match, we use an off-the-shelf nonlinear least squares optimization solver um, because there's often some noise in the, in the three points. If the error from the solver is high, then that means, like in this case, we haven't found a good match, and we're going to repeat this process. So we're going to pick three new randomly chosen points, find out where they appear on the object model, and then try to find a pose which aligns them. If we have a good match, the points will be close together and the error will be low, so we can continue to the next phase of the process. In the next phase of geometric verification, we again consider all the SIFT key points. For each of the key points, we find the nearest neighbor out of all SIFT key points gathered at training time for this hypothesis. So we're doing the same thing as before. Finally, we check the pose that we got from the three-point match to see if it causes these points to also be aligned. If very few points actually match, then that means this pose is probably incorrect. We may have gotten lucky with the three points that we chosen. We chose to do the initial pose match. So in that case, we would start over and repeat the process. If we have a high percentage of matches, that means that this is very likely to be a correct pose. We're going to take all the SIF points that matched in the second phase of the process and run another nonlinear least squares optimization to fine-tune the pose. Now that we have an accurate pose, we do one final dense verification step. For each 2D key point in the test image, we locate the corresponding point on the 3D model according to the pose that we extracted from the uh, previous step of the verification. Then we consider all SIF key points extracted from the training data for the object, which fall within a local neighborhood of that 3D point. In this step, we search for a SIF key point that can explain what we observed in the image. So we don't require that the nearest neighbor SIF feature appears in the point, just that some SIF feature that is sufficiently close appear in this neighborhood. So we do this for every feature that remains. If very few SIF key points pass this check, we again reject this pose and start over. If many SIF key points match, we return this as a valid pose. There are a few final scene consistency checks that we'd perform after we've covered poses for all of these objects. So the first check is that if two poses happen to overlap, sorry, if two recovered poses overlap heavily and they are the same hypothesis, that means we just discard one of them and take, take the better match. One way this can happen is if an occlusion breaks an object into two clusters. 
we can also have uh, two objects appearing in the same, cl same cluster. In this case, we would try to extract one. We remove all the points that fall within the bounding box of that pose, and then we see if there's anything remaining that we could, any large clusters remaining. If there are, then we rerun our pipeline on them. So, what I presented so far is a generic framework you can use for any type of textured rigid object you want to recognize. You need to supply it with multiple connect scans of an object from all sides. This is how the uh, ICRA 2011 Solution to Perception Challenge worked. We submit an algorithm that can be used to train a recognition system. So instead of like giving us data and us training a system on specific objects, we give them a system, they take training data and run it, run it through the system to create a, uh, a classifier. The challenge data set contained two types of data. There are 35 household objects provided by Willow and 15 synthetic objects provided by NIST. There are some examples shown here of both types. Um, our system did quite well at the competition. Uh, we ended up winning the challenge, so the top scores were, were close. Uh, we got 98% precision and 90% recall on the Willow data set, and even better on the NIST data set. Here's a breakdown of how our performance uh, was on the Willow data. So given all the test data, in about 3% of the cases, the correct hypothesis was not uh, selected by the hypothesis selection phase, and it wasn't passed on to pose recovery. Out of the ones that were passed, about 6% resulted in no detection. The pose recovery system didn't think there was an object there. In about 1% of the cases, uh, it came up with the wrong object detection. Finally, in 90% of the cases, uh, we had a correctly localized object. Um, the running time of the different parts of the system are listed on this slide. It takes about 20 seconds for us to run on test frames uh, using 35 objects in our database. We get pretty good accuracy in our recovered poses. So on the left, there's a histogram of the rotation errors, um, and on the right, there's a histogram of our average translation errors. In about 87% of the time, the rotation error is under 10 degrees, and about 88% of the time, the translation error is under 5 centimeters. So um, we've looked at a system that does accurate pose recovery, um, and it does recognition, sorry. In a, we looked at a problem that where we're trying to do recognition with access to the instances of training time under near real-time constraints. Um, what we found was that the geometry of the problem allows us to enable really accurate pose recovery. And the naive Bayes nearest neighbor algorithm effectively narrows a set of hypotheses to be passed to the geometric, geometric verification. Cool. Uh, that's it. Do you have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the hypothesis, it's, it's not, it's, depends on how fast you can do nearest neighbor finding um, for the feature descriptors you used. So um, if you build like the appropriate data structures, um, you could maybe do it in, in like, like amortized sublinear time. Um, if you don't need to search through all the, and in the number of descriptors or sizes of your training set. Does that make sense? Because what we're doing for each object is we're extracting features, and then for each of the features we extract, we need to look up the nearest neighbors in our training data. So as the training data size grows, um, however fast you can perform this operation is how, how fast it will scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the heuristics we use for segmentation, they're pretty standard. We, lo we look for a large planar object in the scene that has um, points above it. Um, and in that sense, like, you know, like gravity is going to pull objects down to support on a table or a floor or a shelf or something. So after we find that, that plane, we, we remove it from the scene, and that creates a bunch of like, objects floating in midair, ideally. And we just do, um, we like pick a random point, clus find a uh, cluster it by adding all nearby points to that cluster. And then we keep doing that until we've taken care of all the points uh, that we see. That's how we break it up into the individual pieces. Okay. Thank you, speaker, one more time. Oh, is there more? I've got more time for questions.